Welcome, welcome to Healthcare for All Washington's second Wednesday speaker series. We're going to uh, address some of the social justice values that surround privacy issues in our healthcare. My name is Ronnie Shore. I'm a retired pharm pharmacist and I volunteer as your president. You can volunteer with Healthcare for All also. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. But if you're considering volunteering, uh, there are options available. Uh, there is work available in our policy committee, our communications committee, our fundraising and outreach committee. So in the chat, we'll be posting a link to our website. You can go to a donate button, and we hope you will. Uh, if you are able to make a donation tonight, you can click on that button uh, or you click on the, the link in the chat and it'll take you to our website. And you also can connect to another uh, button on our website that says get involved, and that will allow you to choose uh, a committee or volunteer for a committee. We would love to have your help. Every donation does make a difference. So if you're able, please take the time to go into the chat and, and do that. Our goal tonight is $250 that we're hoping to raise during tonight's program. And you can go to the chat at any time during the presentation uh, to make a donation or to get involved, to, to join one of those committees, one of our committees. So thank you if you were able to do that. Note that you can click the closed caption icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you hover over the bottom of your screen, you'll see a button that says CC or closed caption. And if you click on that, We've enabled that uh, so that you that captions will appear on your computer. So let's start with uh, a acknowledgement, a land acknowledgement. I'm participating in this Zoom meeting uh, from the lands of the Coast Salish people. Please take a minute to acknowledge peoples in the lands where you're joining us today. I know someone's as far away as Arizona. We acknowledge all of the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous peoples who have been here since time immemorial. Our efforts to achieve healthcare for all include universal healthcare coverage for the Coast Salish peoples of this land, uh, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Muckleshoot, Puyallup, Suquamish, and Tulalip tribes or nations. So what I'm going to do now is bring on uh, on one of our board members, uh, Cello uh, Consuelo, uh, who will introduce our speaker tonight. And our speaker is John Pincus. So Cello, John, you're on. Hi everyone. It is my real pleasure to introduce John Pincus, who I've never met physically. We've only managed to work in the virtual world. He is the founder of Nexus of Privacy, where he writes about the connections between technology, policy, and justice. His career includes founding a successful software engineering startup, General Manager of Competitive Strategies of Microsoft and Co-Chairman of the ACM Computers Freedom and Privacy Conference. In the fall of 2021, he was a member of the Washington State Automated Decision-Making Systems Work Group, and he has a long history of testif testifying about privacy legislation in over a dozen Washington State legislative hearings. So with no further ado, I give you John Pincus. Very much. I'm going to um, share share some slides and then also um, drop them in the chat in in case you in case you'd just rather uh, follow along on your own computer. And I greatly appreciate the uh, the, the opportunity to talk to you today. We're going to talk about you know, my my health, my data bill, and then more generally the future of privacy. 
So I'll start by talking about health data privacy in general and why it matters so much, especially in this post Dobbs world. Then we'll look at the specifics of the My Health, My Data bill, which just passed the state legislature and has been signed into law. Then we'll talk about next steps. You know, we're happy to uh, be tracking questions in the chat. We've got some Q&A time at the end, so you can use, but please drop your questions as, as we're going and we'll track them and, and get back to them later. Let's start by talking about the uh, today's privacy legislation landscape in general. There's no US federal privacy law, no general federal privacy law. There's a couple of what's called spe sector specific laws. HIPAA, for example, is a healthcare privacy law. FERPA regulates school privacy. It's very much a patchwork of existing laws. We've got a strong video privacy law because of a Supreme Court hearing a couple of decades. Some states have what's called a comprehensive privacy law. So a comprehensive privacy law covers everything, not just an individual success, not just an individual state. California was the first state in 2018, they passed them. Since then, several more states, uh, actually even a couple more since I did the first draft of this slide a month ago. There's now seven states with comprehensive state privacy laws. Congress is working on a comprehensive federal privacy law. It's called ADPPA. You know, it's, it's challenging to get anything through Congress. This one has some interesting bipartisan issues. In general, privacy does not break down strictly on party lines. So ADPPA has bipartisan sponsorship. It might still go ahead this year. The good news is that it views privacy as a civil right. Ronnie was talking about the underlying social justice issues that, that are just so much at the core of this. Who gets hurt by surveillance? Who gets hurt by data abuse? Well, it's the people who are marginalized in the other way. Stan Shakuma of Japanese American Citizens League Seattle chapter a couple of years ago, I saw him testify just amazing testimony about how Japanese Americans getting rounded up during World War II and getting sent to internment camps. That was a data abuse error. They use data from the census to round people up. Who gets harmed? The people who are targeted by so many other things. So, you know, it's good that this federal bill views privacy as a civil right. There's other stuff that's not so good about it. And in particular, it would preempt st stronger state comprehensive privacy laws. Industry likes the idea of just having a single law that, that can go everywhere, but states are the laboratories of democracies. We wanna be able to work on our own privacy laws at the state. So you'll notice I talked about comprehensive privacy laws in many other states. We don't yet have a comprehensive privacy law here. And it's not for lack of trying. For four years in a row, Industry pushed um, the bill that I call the Bad Washington Privacy Act. Uh, it's officially called the Washington Privacy Act, but it was not a good bill. It was extremely weak, filled with all kinds of loopholes and exemptions and not giving people a lot of rights. We stopped it here, but it's been the basis for laws in Virginia, Colorado, Connecticut, Indiana. Tech lobbyists have a lot of influence. I've got a, a bunch of links here that, um, that look at this. And one part of the reason why I wanted to include this here is, you know, the dynamics are not dissimilar to healthcare. You've got huge for-profit companies who have a lot of power and a lot of influence, and they want to write the legislation. Specifically looking at health data privacy today, well, we do have HIPAA. You know, if you've gone to the doctors, you've signed a HIPAA disclosure, no doubt. HIPAA protects information that's held by what's called cover entities, doctors, hospitals, health plans, insurance companies, clinics. Compor important things about HIPAA, it requires a signed authorization before selling your data. You know, it's got some holes, it needs to be updated, at least it's something. And consumer health data isn't protected by HIPAA. So what does this mean? This means things like apps, websites, your Google searches, your purchasing history on Amazon, data that comes from your Fitbits or your Apple Watches or whatever wearables you have. None of this has any protection today. And so that means in general, companies can do whatever they want with that information. And the result, well, you know, I've got a bunch of headlines here just you don't have to look very hard to track all these privacy stories. Better help is an online therapy application. 
They shared customer data, mental health data with Facebook after promising that was private, but you know, they gave it to Facebook to be able to run more effective ads, and not just Facebook. They gave it to Google and Snapchat and a bunch of other places as well. And that was bad enough that the FTC intervened. You can buy a list of people with depression or, or really any other mental, um, mental health issue from data brokers. Um, people don't take good, people aren't, don't, uh, don't protect this health data very much. And so there's tons of health data breaches where they just get distributed everywhere. Uh, Christine Conard, an indivisible person I work with, she testified last year about, she got a, and I'm sure this has happened to all of us, she got a health, a, a letter from some company she had never heard of that said, oh, we've got your health data and a hacker got at our system. How did they get her health data? She has no idea, maybe something to do with vaccination, maybe something to do with some clinic she went to at the senior center. You got no way of knowing where this data is going. So, you know, it's it's not good. The list of horror stories goes on. Um, and historically it's been, you know, everybody agrees it's a problem, but industry has been, su has such strong lobbying that it's been very hard to do anything about it. The Dobbs decision overturning Roe changed the landscape here completely. You know, what happened is for many relatively privileged people, privacy went from being this abstract, oh, you know, privacy is good. I don't want people to know all my business. You know, that's good, but it's not really emotional, right? It went from being this abstract to, oh, my God, people I care about can go to jail. Oh, my God, I could go to jail. You know, as straights criminalize abortion and gender affirming care. And, and they have civil enforcement statutes, so it's not just law enforcement who can support the law, it's bounty hunters and vigilantes can, can, can target people. Washington plays a really key role here. We support a lot of out-of-state visitors coming here for reproductive or gender-affirming care. Um, and gosh, health data can be used to target these people. You know, how does law enforcement, what kind of data can they use? Both, many of these are examples that have already happened. They can get at people's texts and messages. There was a couple, in, uh, a mother-daughter in Nebraska where they, they, they subpoenaed her messages from Facebook and showed that, oh, yeah, the mother was helping her daughter get an abortion, and they charged both of them. You can just buy the information. Um, $160 will get you a list of all the people who have visited Planned Parenthood clinics in the last week. That's a deal. You know, you can find people, there have been uh, another case where somebody's web searches were used to prosecute her for getting an abortion. We're just looking at your purchase history on your rewards card. There's enough information there for companies to target you with uh, coupons for, for discounts for expectant parents. Well, good news from a coupon standpoint, but that same information could be used for law enforcement. License plate readers, the, the, the list goes on. Then in particular, there's data from crisis pregnancy centers, also called CPCs. These are so-called so -called crisis pregnancy centers. These are fake clinics that are set up by anti-abortion people to try, you know, they do very good search engine optimization. And so they try to get people who are pregnant thinking of doing something about it and they bring them in and pressure them not to get abortions. So that's, that's, you know, everybody in Washington agreed this is a problem and that it's time to do something about it. My health, my data uh, was introduced as part of a package of five reproductive health bills. And the bill number I forgot to put here was HB 1155. Um, uh, Representative Vandana Slatter was the, the uh, sponsor of the House bill. Senator Dingra co-sponsored the Senate companion bill, and this was AG request legislation. So it was developed with AG Ferguson and the Attorney General's office who took the lead in drafting a lot of it. And what it does is, you know, the, it basically the goal was to provide HIPAA-like protections for the data that's not current, this health consumer health data that's not currently covered by HIPAA. So that means making sure that, that entities get uh, get consent before they collect or share your health data. That's a huge change. I mean, it, it sounds like, well, of course they should do that, but that's not currently, th that's not currently the norm. 
then there's an additional signed authorization, just like HIPAA, for, for anybody to sell the customer health data. And this has to be renewed every year. It gets rid of what's called geofences. Geofences are an ad targeting technique where they put a virtual boundary around a location and target ads at people at that location. So anti-abortion groups were using this to target ads at people visiting reproductive health clinics saying, you know, virulently anti-abortion ads. And so this stops that practice. It requires sites to post privacy policies for consumers' health data. Again, this doesn't sound like a big deal, but when I was part of this, I looked at what some of these crisis pregnancy centers currently say they're going to do with their health data. And all they say is, well, we, we won't do anything unless you consent or it's allowed by the law. Well, right now, everything is allowed by the law. So what their privacy policy basically says is we can do what we're going to do whatever we want with your data. Requiring people to be more specific about what they're doing by posting these privacy policies, that's got a lot of value. And there's more. You can see what data a company is holding on you or tell companies to delete it. You can revoke your consent for whatever they've gathered and they have to get rid of it. Companies break the law. Well, two things. One, the attorney general can go after them because they're breaking the law. Two, there's what's called a private right of action. We can sue, we as individuals can sue under the Consumer Protection Act and hold them liable and get damages, get an injunction to stop them from what, what they're doing. Um, takes effect at the end of next March for the most part. Small businesses get an extra three months. So there's, a, there's at least one clause that cut, kicks in earlier, but that's, that's the basics of the bill. Industry reaction to this is, this is huge. This is seismic. Uh, former Microsoft uh, Chief Privacy, Privacy Counsel Mike Hintze says, my health, my data will be the most consequential legislation that's enacted this year. And maybe the most consequential privacy legislation since California in 2018. This next quote, this is a long one from a lobbyist saying, well, how industry is going to react. You know, they don't like the fact that they have to ask permission before we're going to, before they're going to use our data. They want to be able to keep doing whatever they want without permission. So, so what they're saying is this bill is now going to require so many opt-in notifications for everyday activities. You have to opt in to give your consent to share the data. That that it's just going. Everything else is going to get lost in the shuffle. They're going to bombard people with these opt-in consent locations to um to to just overwhelm people. The, the sky will fall. There's going to be nothing. Oh my oh my heavens! What what on earth will we? This is all nonsense, right? This is just industry fear mongering. Europe with the GDPR data bill and data regulation has required this opt-in consent for all data for the last seven or eight years. The sky has not yet fallen in Europe. We're going to be just fine. The strength of this reaction just shows how, how threatening this is to industry as a whole. Because it's stronger than other state le privacy legislation in some important ways. I mean, there's there, it's not an all or nothing thing. There are other ways in which California's privacy legislation is, is broader or stronger than my health data, but let's look at where my health, my data is stronger. First of all, it applies to entities of all sizes, including not, and it includes nonprofits. A lot of other state privacy legislation doesn't, um, you know, exempts nonprofit or only applies to large companies. You have to opt in. You have to give people permission in advance to use your data, unlike California's rule, which is opt out. With an opt out rule, they can use your data unless you tell them otherwise. And who's got the time to go and opt out of everything? So opt in is much more privacy friendly. And like I said, there's this additional authorization required for data sale. A lot of other... State privacy bills have what's have, have what's called a right to cure. This basically says when there's a problem, they get a get out of jail free card and they get to fix it. And my health, my data doesn't have that. You know, 
other all, other kinds of consumer legis protection legislation also doesn't have a right to cure. So in some sense, my health, my data is just saying, well, let's treat privacy just like everything else. But industry is so used to getting these special exemptions that they don't like getting the same treatment as everybody else. There's, a, there's other ways in which it's stronger. It's got a lot fewer loopholes and exemptions than these other um, agencies. And then it's got this private right of action where we can, um, which gives us the right to sue companies who break the law. Now, this is something that's been just a huge battle in, in privacy legislation everywhere. Industry had successfully blocked a private right of action in other state, in other state bills. So that means even if companies break the law and invade your privacy in California, Virginia, Colorado, you can't sue them for that. My health, my data, you can. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk a bit, mount, bit, bit more about uh, data and health data in, in, in Europe uh, later on when we talk to, about what's next. Good question. Um, so let's talk about the, uh, the way this private right of action, the argument that made it so powerful that Washington actually adopted it. And it really relates to these fake crisis pregnancy centers. Because like I say, this is what took it from being the abstract. Well, of course we should have the right to sue people when our rights are violated to being something really concrete. Wow, if we don't do this, pregnant people are going to be unsafe. This, uh, this example comes from um, a document that Legal Voice, the, uh, the Seattle-based nonprofit, put together uh, as part of the My Health, My Data discussions. Imagine this woman, Jane, seeking abortion care. She accidentally adds, ends up at a crisis pregnancy center. You know, they, they gather all of her information as one does when one comes to a real clinic. They do it at a fake clinic, too. They create a profile in their database. They share it with everybody. Suppose they do this without her consent. Well, if they do this without her consent, then under the private right of action, she can use the Consumer Protection Act to sue them and to get them to stop sharing the information and possibly to get compensation for the harms she caused. If we don't have a private right of action, well, then Jane's in, not in great shape. The Attorney General's office doesn't, doesn't represent private individuals. The attorney general's office can only get involved once there's a pattern of abuse. So they have to wait until they receive multiple complaints. Once they do that, then they could get involved, but that can take years. And so getting the right, you know, grounding these things in the very specifics of, wow, here's, here's the kind of person who will be hurt, who will not have recourse if we don't have this private right of action proved incredibly powerful. I've linked out to a, um, a really great short talk by uh, Senator Yasmin Trudeau in, a, in an Indivisible podcast where she goes into all of this in more detail and looking at the other things that are getting done in Washington to, pro to protect the rights of people who are visiting from out of state. Oops. And it's really this this kind of going from the um, going from the perspective of like I say the Dobbs decision changed everything. Looking at the perspective of the people who are getting reproductive health services in Washington, that's what drives so much of these ways in which my health, my data is stronger than other states. For example, applying to entities of all sizes, including nonprofits. Well, if we want to regulate crisis pregnancy centers. They're small. Many of them are incorporated as nonprofits. Oh, I guess that needs to be covered. You know, the the um, getting rid of the right to care. Senator Dingra actually talked about this in 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 the Senate floor debate. That a Republican had brought an amendment to get rid of a right to care. I'm sorry, it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a Republican. It was uh, Senator Mullet um, had brought an amendment to get rid of the right to cure and. And as Senator Dingra says, well, if somebody who's coming come to Washington to seek reproductive health care or gender affirming health care, if their data gets somehow sent without their consent to law enforcement in Idaho who goes after them, 
How do you cure that? What does the right to cure even mean in that case? Oh, that's a really powerful argument. But even though we're, we're focusing just, and even though I'm focusing on the reproductive health data, these things are just as important for all kinds of other data as well. So mental health data, for example, we, I talked about better health, the, uh, the online mental health data that shared people's data with Facebook. You know, mental health data gets used to discriminate against people. Mental health data can, you know, any kind of disability related data can be the basis for not hiring somebody, for not giving somebody an apartment. I mean, they can't legally do that, of course, but it happens all the time. So that data is just as, you know, it exposes people to other threats as well. All of this data needs to be protected um, to an equally high level. Looking at it in terms of reproductive health care, that helps make things very concrete. One of the unique features about my health, my data, is that I got a very broad definition of health care, of, of health data. And when we think about health data, well, okay, you think about the stuff directly from your doctors, your test results. Okay, that's clearly health data. You think of your diagnoses. Yep, all right. But what about stuff like pulse data or, or other, other, other kinds of um, bodily functions and vital signs? Yeah, that's data because it's health related. How about information from a CPAC machine? Now, now CPAC machines are online where they can send this information back. You have an app to monitor it. Well, that's very useful. Oh, but wait, that's health data too. That needs to be tracked. If I go to Amazon and I buy something, if I buy a book called 48 Things to Do After the Doctor Says It's Cancer, is that health data? Hmm. How about biometric data? Is that health data? Something that comes a lot. And so biometric data can be anything that can automatic, you know, can let somebody be identified from like a fingerprint is biometric data, a, a voice print is biometric data. Those can all be used as health data. When we look at reproductive health services or gender affirming care, information that shows that somebody's been to a clinic or attempted to acquire or receive health services or supplies. Yeah, you know, that's health data too. So this is a very broad definition because it has to be. If you really want to protect health data, it needs to be this broad. This is, I think, one of the things that has industry kind of freaked out about the bill that today the bills that regulate other than HIPAA, which only applies to doctors, hospitals, et cetera, some of the state privacy bills, they just say, well, health data is sensitive data, but they're not specific about what, what health data is. So companies can, have successfully pretended that none of this data is health data. Under my health, my data, no, they're not going to be able to pretend it is health data. So I've talked about all the positive things about my health data. Let's talk about how there's also a lot more to do. For one thing, data held by government agencies is exempt. This only relates to data that's held by businesses and nonprofits. So that's a problem when you know so many people get their health care from um, or health insurance from government agencies or people who are incarcerated. All of, a lot of their information is getting tracked there or people who are college students all of their health, consumer health information, a lot of that can go to the university. So that I think is an area where, where things definitely needed to be brought, need to be broadened. And we were talking before the main session started, I think this is an area where the, the healthcare for all direction very much intersects with the, uh, the privacy focus, because as we think about healthcare for all, we really need to make sure that it involves healthcare with strong privacy protections for all so that people aren't giving up their privacy in order to in order to get what what is after all a human right employment data is also exempt now to some extent these things are yeah, these are the kinds of necessarily political compromises you need to do to get through to get a bill through the Washington state legislature here today Industry resisted the, the bill as it was, they would have resisted it much, much, much more fiercely if it covered employment data as well. Um, 
So for a company like Amazon, for example, where they have a lot of their employees wearing some kind of wearables, they don't want that to be covered by my health, my data, and at least so far they've succeeded. It's also some um, big um, loopholes for companies that process data on the behalf of companies or government agencies. They're largely exempt. I wouldn't be surprised if a company like Microsoft, for example, wound up supporting this bill because from their perspective, that's a lot of what they do. And then we talked a couple, I talked a couple of times about the value of an authorization, requiring an authorization to sell data. I mean, that's good, but we all kind of sign um, these HIPAA authorizations that Representative Reeves even talked about this in the House floor debate. She said, you know, we just sign these HIPAA authorizations without even thinking about them. And yeah, that's kind of true. And if everybody winds up signing all these authorizations without even thinking about them, then there's no real additional protection. So there's going to need to be some education going on there. So, you know, with all this, it's just the first step in what we eventually need. That said, it's a big step. It's a, it's a, it's it's a huge first step. I, as you can tell, I, I have a hard time knowing how to talk about it. It's It's a huge accomplishment. I mean, getting this Getting something as strong as this through, when I talk with people in the privacy community elsewhere, they're just astonished that this happened. At the same time, man, there's so much more that still needs to be done. So the question is how to build on the uh, how to build on on this success. You know, in the short term, well, what one thing that's a really high priority uh, is this doesn't take effect until March 31 of next year. There's a good opportunity to educate people on how to protect themselves in the interim. You know, that's particularly important for people visiting from Idaho or other states where where abortion is criminalized or gender affirming care is is, is criminalized, because because you know those laws are taking effect now, and so. People are at risk until the bill until the bill's protections kick in. I mean, in a lot of ways, if people think that they're safe and they're not, this is in some ways the highest risk time. So I don't have an answer for how this needs to happen. We're starting to re-engage with people to say, all right, how can we do this education? There's ongoing activism on bunches of other uh, on bunches of other issues, not just in um, Washington State. So the site uh, HeyGoogle.info. This is um, when um, right after the Dobbs decision came up, everybody realized, oh my God, when we're tracking um, data about uh, people who are going to reproductive health clinics, that Google is tracking that data. Google is making that available to advertisers. That that introduces some some huge risks. Google said, "Oh yeah, you're right. We'll, we'll, we'll promise not to um, just get rid of information that we're tracking, location information we're tracking with people when they visit reproductive health clinics." And their Google, they've got a list of all the reproductive health clinics in the U.S. And so they they said that they were going to delete that data automatically. Eh, they lied, or there's a bug, or something. Turns out they're not actually doing that. So. Here's a campaign that's um, pressuring Google to uh, to try to get try to get rid of that, in order to to stop doing that and to really get rid of that data. There's a lot of work on federal legislation as well. I'll um, you know, I'll I'll skip over it in the interest of time. But there's as well as this comprehensive privacy bill where we've been working with our state legislators to try to encourage them to strengthen it. There's some good bills out there that would. Um, these are more. These are in general more general health data. Oh, sorry, general data, not just healthcare data. There's some good bills out there that we protect. There's um, there's some bad bills out there that have good intent but would have unfortunate consequences. There's some, and then you know there's there's next session. Um, well, like so many other bills, this is the first year of the biennium. There may well be modifications coming in next time. Privacy legislation is complex. There may well be things to there that really do need to be cleaned up. Also, lobbyists will be um, looking for attempts to weaken the bill. And at the same time, we'll be pushing to strengthen and broaden the bill. How much appetite will the legislature have for that? You know, we're not completely sure. 
So we need to do a lot of awareness and some legislator education in the interim. And then finally, you know, continuing to build the coalition. I think one of the things that privacy advocates have never been great at is getting outside the universe of, well, people who, who care already care passionately and know a lot about privacy. That's great. I'm one of those people. We should all, I wish everybody was like this, but in practice, no. That's just a small sliver of the world. What we really need to be doing is working in coalition with other people. So my health, my data, the activism was so successful because it was the reproductive rights groups who were taking the lead and the gender justice groups who were taking the lead. We need to be working broadly in coalition with the groups who are most at risk to be to be building on the sec success to strengthen and, and broaden bills. Let's see. So, you know, I, I dropped, um, I've, I've got lots of links in here. If, if you're um, looking for, uh, here, here's the slides again, got, got lots of additional reading if you're um, interested. Um, but at this point, let's see. So, so, Peter, Peter, um, oh, actually, right. So um, Consuelo asked about um, about what's being done to protect data and health data in general, in, in particular in Europe. So in Europe, they've got a they've got a very different approach to what we're doing to, to what we're doing here. I would say they're much more um, privacy conscious there. They don't separate out different kinds of data. To some extent, the the Trying to separate out different kinds of data came as something that industry has been pushing to try to get lower protection on some kind of data instead of saying, no, it should all have to have protection this high. And we could see that in the in the what goes into consumer health data. Hmm. If you say, well, should purchases of books, should they have the same protection as health data? The, the initial response is no, of course not. But then when you think about it, well, it really depends on what book and it depends on what you're correlating these purchases with and, and, and hmm, it's complex. So Europe in general, they've got the, uh, the GDPR is in existence. They've got several suites of new, new legislation that's coming in. That's just going through the, uh, the EU, the digital marketing act and the digital services act provide some substantial additional protections, and they focused a lot on the largest companies. The, the rulemaking for those is still, still being finalized, so they haven't come into effect yet, but they're going to continue to be ahead of, of the U.S. Peter, that's a good question as well, but why don't I defer that to... So, let, yeah, let's put here. some more questions. Let's ask people to add their questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so we'll chat. defer that to the Q&A and... period, and then please add, add some more questions in the chat. So add some questions to the chat. We will take a minute for Cello and John to uh, review those questions and put that together. Uh, so while they're doing that, let me introduce another board member, uh, Peter Lucas, who will talk to us a bit about the donation uh, or, or making a donation if you are able. Peter? Uh, thank you, Ronnie. Um, John, that's that's a great presentation. You really, I learned a lot and you've raised my consciousness and I look forward to when you answer my question. Um, our great organization, Healthcare for All, has chalked up many legislative victories in, in Olympia, including helping to establish and appoint members to the Universal Healthcare Commission. And this group possibly could craft a publicly financed universal system based on our bill uh, the Washington Health Security Trust. So we hope something will come out of this group uh, fairly soon. And we were very active in the in the most recent legislative session, uh, and many of the progressive bills that we supported and lobbied for were passed. And for an update on these, uh, you can uh, click on the legislation tab on our website, and you'll see that we had a lot of successes this past uh, session. But in order to maintain our momentum, it is vitally important that we meet with our legislators Supporters to spread the word about universal health care to their family, friends, and most importantly, those in power in Olympia. 
We can achieve these goals through the hard work of our lobbyists and communication specialists, social media, monthly webinars such as tonight's excellent presentations, presentation, meetings with civic groups, and by hosting other events. Uh, none of this comes free. Financial support of our employees as well as our other activities and obligations all require funds, which is why we are asking you to donate tonight. Our goal tonight is $250. Please go to the links in the chat or our website and click on the donate button. You can make a one-time donation, but we would especially appreciate it if you can make monthly recurring donations to help support us throughout the year. So please donate so we can spread the word and bring about universal publicly financed healthcare in Washington. That is the moral imperative. Back, back to you, uh, Ronnie and Cello. Thanks, Peter. So John, uh, just to add to what uh, Peter said, I just before the bill was passed, uh, Pro-Choice Washington had a educational program uh, and they brought in some experts, including Attorney General uh, Bob Ferguson. I got more out of your presentation than I did sitting through each of those. So I too appreciate putting this information uh, before us and, and talking about how we can build on this. So, Cello, uh, if you want to unmute yourself, uh, maybe the two of you, you and John, can go through uh, a few questions. Okay, so shall we do Peter's and then Sherry's? Well, let's take it in the uh, in, in the opposite order because Sherry's is part of the answer to Peter. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so you know, as Sherry funds herself thinking about the medical research articles she reads in peer-reviewed journal. How to balance the need for data like this to understand the function of our healthcare system with individual privacy? This is a genuine. This is genuinely challenging. Yeah. Um, you know the, the the short answer is well there's there's an exemption in my health my data for peer reviewed research that's been approved by and in the public interest that's been approved by an institutional uh, review board or an equivalent um so there is a there is an exemption designed to um address this of course that's not all research and there's man it's we could really see a lot of this going on in terms of the federal privacy bill where the exemptions that you get a lot of research that's getting done by industry including small startups these days and they cut a lot of corners on the one hand yeah that's the engine of innovation on the other hand yeah just how many corners do you want them to be cutting with this kinds of stuff and so um other legislation has had much broader exemptions. My health, my data has a relatively narrow exemption. Again, your public interest um, approved by IRB is, is good. And then it's also gotten a, um, an exemption for de-identified data, where a lot of this data get a lot of this research gets done on de-identified data, which means that there's no way to, re to map it back to the original person. Well, unfortunately, it means it's theoretically that there's no way, but in practice, there is a way. And so this is another place where, well, you want to be enabled to, uh, to, you want to enable this research, but you don't want to make it such a big loophole that it enables exploitation of this under the guise of people who claim they're doing research. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, to some extent, again, I would say, look, look at, Europe research has research continues in Europe. They've been able to look, work within the domains of a strong privacy law, so it's solvable. And then, Peter, this goes back to your question: the lobbyists that they make are basically, well, the sky's gonna, the sky will fall. You're gonna kill innovation. And they never talk about the adverse impact on their profits. No, no, no. It's going to kill innovation, and then it's going to lead to consumers uh, being bombarded with so many requests to opt in that we're all going to get tired and it, and our lives are going to be miserable. Um, industry, you know, in Europe, when GDPR put in the um, cookie requirements, 
That's what companies did originally. They just bombarded people with those stupid cookie dialogues at every single drop of a hat. And, and then over time, though, things have gotten a lot better. They've now gotten to the point where, well, you know, if, if once, once you do the cookie dialogue, you're done with it, you don't have to see it again. Industries who, you know, companies who want to compete will find a good way to give this, this, um, like to give a good experience. Apple, for example, was able to do opt-in on the iPhone and people still use their iPhone. But industry claims, no, 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 consumers' lives are going to be made miserable. So I'd say those are the uh, basis of their, um, th those are the basis of their objections, that it's going to be too hard and difficult to comply with. Um, oh, right. And then another favorite one, particularly with this right of private action, is it's going to lead to zillions of frivolous lawsuits. <clears throat> In the Senate floor debate, Senator Cooter was, uh, she was very irate about this. She said, you know, as, as a lawyer, it's like, no, there are relatively few frivolous lawsuits and people who are doing truly frivolous lawsuits are going to get into trouble. Um, but that's a specter that industry raises. And that particularly with Republicans, that's very effective that they position Republicans position this bill as a giveaway to uh, trial lawyers. And I think that we haven't answered Ronnie's question yet. Oh, what was Ronnie's question? What shall we do if we seek healthcare services or information from sources outside of specific healthcare clinics, hospitals, labs, or pharmacies? Are there any red flags to watch for? Oh, um, I think he must have just sent that to you. I didn't see that in the chat. Uh, um, let's see. Well, I would say I would say even even today, before this before this has gone gone into place, you want to make sure that a site has their privacy policy posted. If they don't have a privacy policy, then that's a sign that they're not taking this seriously at all. So I'd say not having any policy up there is a big, big red flag. I would say in general, assume that anything you're doing is going to be tracked unless you're taking active countermeasures. So for example, use a virtual private network so that your IP address isn't getting tracked. Make sure that you're not logged into Facebook or Google or anything else. You know, don't run the apps on your phone if you're if you're looking at protected health information there. And I, you know, make sure because they'll track you whether or not the app is currently active. Um, you know, sign it, sign up under, I, I have a throwaway email account. It's like when I have to sign up for email accounts on things, I'll send it to my throwaway email account. None of these things are bulletproof, but, but they all help raise the bar. There's um, uh, Digital Defense League has a, um, has a really good page on how um, on people protecting their guide to abortion privacy. You know, it's not just useful for people seeking abortions; it's people for useful for people keeping any kind of medical uh, data private. <clears throat> There's trade-offs here, right? Every, everybody everybody winds up making their own decision as to how much to reveal and how much not to reveal. My partner. Um, used to run a privacy nonprofit. She takes privacy very seriously, not on Facebook, just, you know, not, not, just not going there. She uses DuckDuckGo instead of Google. She um, runs Firefox instead of Chrome. It doesn't, doesn't shop on Amazon. All of these things, there's value in all of these things. All of these things are potential trade-offs. So did, did that get, get at what you were asking, Ronnie? I think Ronnie, you're muted. Certainly, uh, I, uh, I I I know that uh, seniors uh, or people that don't look for warning signs like that really get ambushed by. A simple telephone call uh, and going in to seek out care 
outside of their of a licensed healthcare provider uh, can really trigger a lot of different problems. So it's exciting to see this data building up. Uh, I, I think having political action about uh, is 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 the key to moving this forward and to getting to the next step. Uh, but that was my question: is is there something I can advise? Uh, my peers about uh, is there something that uh, isn't readily available uh, to uh, look for so telling us you know that there should be you know just waking up to the fact that there should be a policy statement that is visible it's not in these little small print on your iPhone or at the bottom of a form uh, that there should be a policy uh, that we uh, policy process that we can stop and look at. So, thanks for addressing that. I, I guess one 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 other thing I'd say is, um, my partner is caregiver for somebody with Alzheimer's, and um, there is you know really excellent all forum online run by Alzheimer's Org. Everything there is public, right? It's very easy to forget that so much of what we do on the web, any Facebook post you make, is public. You know, there's nothing the matter with saying things that are public. You just need to be conscious of this. You know, specifically dealing with uh, with elder fraud. I mean, that's that's a huge problem. And one of these data brokers was actually they actually had services that they marketed specifically to people to, to elder fraudsters. So I think the message is, uh, do, you know, be very careful about the links that you click on. If you get a call, don't don't believe who don't necessarily believe that it's the call is from who they're claiming they are. Try to verify it. These are more. Um, I, I think of that more as anti fraud more than just privacy from the privacy perspective. But it relates though, right? It's that huh, don't just because they know something about you, that doesn't mean that they are who they say they are. And I think that's. Using that to create this this trust is a huge issue. So if we go into a program like you and Peter were talking about or that you addressed about behavioral health, some online program that we're seeking out care, even if they uh, an outside person can't pull up specific information, just knowing that we're going there, knowing that we're getting DNA testing, knowing that we're going to uh, a uh, healthcare or seeking out healthcare services or that could apply to cancer or uh, HIV or something that could uh, be misused by insurance companies or by other data gatherers. Uh, and it is just frightening to see how when I'm going looking at information on uh, my Google uh, searches, how it comes back the next day or the next week, repeating that search. It, it's clear that somebody knows that I was looking at a particular type of shoe or something. Uh, so knowing that we're looking at healthcare issues that way is really important. And it's those clinics uh, that are not really clinics that are like pushing the information uh, yep. On, yep. Uh, yep. on on gender affirming right. care, on abortion, yep. and you, you you mentioned Idaho, but boy, it's happening in yep. many many parts of the country, and the reproductive rights people in our state are building coalitions. Uh, it's so powerful to see you stepping up and being a part of that uh, coalition and of that information to clarify it. So do you have any closing words to share with us before we uh, move into uh, a, a I, I, Actually, here? I thought of what, what, one more point in terms of your last question. Um, something like my chart that so many doctor's offices use for scheduling Try not to use it. In most places, it, it's it's inconvenient. Again, this is one of the ones where where you're where there's a convenience balance. But 
there's almost always some way that you can avoid using that. So if you're concerned about privacy, just look for ways to say no. Just say no. <laughs> just say no, yeah. So um, closing remarks. So, I'm the, so th thanks very much for the, uh, for, for the opportunity to talk to you. Like I say, this is, um, you know, when we first started talking about this, the, the first reactions, oh, too bad this didn't happen during the session. Eh, you know what? It's just fun. This isn't over. It's like, this is just one step. And then I, I just really do think that as we think about the, uh, the commonalities of, of getting healthcare for all, making sure that it's privacy protective healthcare for all, I think there's a lot of synergies there. I agree. I agree. And, and, and thanks so much, John. There are so many barriers in the way uh, as we are developing services for specific groups. Uh, they're afraid to come into uh, uh, and, and, and access these services because there could be an immigration officer there or there could be someone reading about it online. So Thank you so much for raising our awareness, for taking your time to do that. I also want to thank the volunteers uh, that you saw, Cello, uh, Echeverria, and Peter Lucas, but also the people behind the scenes like Rich Lagu. Thank you, Rich, for helping bring people in. Uh, to D.W. Clark for recording this. This will be on our website if you want to look for that information. And our communications people will enter that uh, uh, the, 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 the PowerPoint that will have those references available. So if you didn't click on them in the chat, when John shared it with us, there's still an opportunity to do that. And Marsha is back behind the scenes there, but supporting this program as well. So thank each of you for your help tonight. And please join us next month. Uh, uh, our second Wednesday program will be June 14th. So thank you to everyone and, and especially to each of you for joining us tonight. It was pretty sunny out at 7 p.m. So thanks for pulling away from that yellow orb in the sky and joining us. And have a lovely evening. Thanks again. Bye-bye, everyone.